So to continue our discussion on root solving, we'll be talking about bracketed methods, in particular the bisection method. So for more complicated problems, we decided that we need an additional set of tools in order to be able to find the roots. And one such tool is the bracketed method, or a series of bracketed methods. And it works by uh, the fact that if a function changes sign over an interval from A to B, and it's continuous over that same interval, we can bracket the root. And the advantage here is that we'll always converge if the above statements are true. That is, the interval changes sign and it's continuous. But the disadvantage is that it might be slow. So what is a continuous or discontinuous function? A good example here are trig functions. So the sine equation is continuous. So there are no breaks or discrete points where we have gaps. On the other hand, the tangent equation is discontinuous because it goes to infinity and negative infinity. So we cannot use a bracketed method over this discontinuity. However, we can use the bracketed method in the region of this discontinuous function where it's continuous, say, between 2 and 4. The way a bracketed method works is we determine an initial interval. We'll call it the lower bound xl and the upper bound xu for which the function changes sign and it is continuous. And then we approximate a root by predicting some point between them, we'll call xr, which is our approximation of the root. And we need to make sure that xr is greater than xl, but less than xu. And once we do that, we keep one portion of the interval depending on where the function changes sign. So to look at this graphically, we have a lower bound xl. The function at the lower bound is positive. We have a upper bound xu and the function is negative. It's a continuous function, so somewhere in here it crosses the x-axis. So we could make an approximation of the root here at 3, and this approximation is positive. So between xl and xr, the function is positive and positive, so it does not change signs. Between xr and xu, it does change signs. So now we know that we have a smaller interval between xr and xu, that changes signs and is continuous, so we would then repeat the process. So we readjust our bounds, we call xr our new xl, and we have a smaller interval, and we would just continue our bracketed method. So a specific form of a bracketed method is the bisection method, and of all the bracketed methods, we just need some method of approximating the root, and the bisection method simply takes the average of your bounds. So we're cutting our interval in half every single time. So the steps to the bisection method are step one, find the interval bounds xl to xu such that it's continuous and change of signs. A quick mathematical check here is that if the function at xl times the function at xu is less than zero, then you have a change in sign. Next, we would approximate the root by finding the average of the bounds. Then you evaluate the function at the root, and then we keep one portion of the interval. So we keep the left-hand side, if the function at the lower bound times the function at the root is less than zero, or we keep the right-hand side if this is not true. Then we would check for convergence using something like an approximate percent relative error, as shown in previous videos. And then we would repeat steps two through five until we end up with a converged solution. Next, we'll take a look at a bisection method example. So here we're given a function f of x equals 1.5x squared minus 10 plus 1 half e to the negative x over 2 and a half. We cannot solve this using the quadratic equation or quadratic formula because there's this exponential term in here. But what we want to do is find the roots of the equation f of x between the interval 1 and 3 and a half, and we want to assume a convergence criteria of 0.1%. This will end up being the approximate percent relative error. The figure here shows the equation between those bounds, 1 and 3 and a half. And to get started here, we need to evaluate the function at our bounds. So we have f at 1 is negative 8.165, and f at 3 and a half is 8.49. So one's positive, one's negative. It's continuous, so we have a root somewhere in between those two. So we can proceed with step 2. So we would approximate our root. So we take the bounds, we average them, we get 2 and a half or 2.25, and then we would evaluate our function at xr, so f at 2.25 gives you negative 2.203. Going back to our function, 
plot up here. Here's the lower bound, here's the function at the lower bound, here's the root approximation, and then the function at the root approximation. So in looking at the graphical plot, we can see that the root's on the right-hand side between xr and xu, and then we can prove that mathematically by looking at the product of f at xl times f at xr. They're both negative. So then we want to keep xr to xu, so our new interval is 2.25 3.5. We'll check the convergence criteria. Um, we can do that by comparing it to one of the bounds since this is our first iteration. So 2.25 minus 1 divided by 2.25 absolute value times 100. So we currently have an error of 55.5%. So we're going to have to iterate. So we start again with our new bounds and we approximate the root. So our new bounds were 2.25 and 3.5. And we find the average we get a new value of our estimate of the root, we evaluate the function at that value, and then we determine which half to keep. So f at our lower bound is negative, f at our root approximation currently is positive, so now we know we want to find a root between 2.25 and 2.875. So we cut our interval again and we continue until we converge. So we can check our convergence. So our previous estimate was 2.25, our current is 2.875. We subtract them, divide by the current estimate, and multiply by 100, and we have an error still of 21.74%. So we would want to continue with iterations 3, 4, 5, and so on. And if we do that, we have our approximations here, our successive approximations, and a corresponding error. So in order to get down to 0.1% error, we would have to do 10 iterations. Uh, quick look graphically here. Here was increment 1. We keep the right-hand interval, so here's increment 2. And we would keep the left-hand interval of that side, and we continue in this fashion until we converge on this error, which is 2.56006. And that's accurate to under 0.1% relative error.